So our next speaker is uh, Dr. John Gozer. He's Rock River Labs. Uh, I've had the privilege to get to know John over the last three years since I've been with Lalamond. He's been a, a tremendous resource, uh, just a wealth of knowledge. And so I'm going to turn it over to him from a standpoint of time here and uh, let him get going on his topic, which is fermentation analysis and the importance of that. And what, could, what does that really mean for your businesses? So, John, it's all yours. And uh, all right, so a little bit about me. Uh, you see my wife and kids, uh, those are really driving factors uh, for, for me in life. Uh, my father was a nutritionist for 25 years. I, I walk in his footsteps. Uh, we lost him a few years back, but I'm pretty passionate about what I do. Uh, those of you that have gotten to know me, you've experienced that. If you have not, you're about to experience it. So hang on. And then I've got a picture of uh, some silage. And I, I pose the question, how the hell did I get into silage? I, I was trained as an academic thoroughbred, not inbred, thoroughbred at the University of Wisconsin with bachelor's, master's, PhD, all the way through. And I'm, I'm happy that I'm not giving an agronomy talk. I have a little bit of an agronomy background, a little bit of plant breeding and genetics background, but I focus mostly on ruminant nutrition, mostly dairy, but I've gotten into beef more so. Uh, and I've gotten into beef kind of in the same way I've gotten into silage uh, and it's through experience, through fire, by being out in the industry and, and just learning as I go. Uh, so that's my connection with, with silage. And so I'll, I'll share some experiences. Uh, I'm happy to follow uh, in Mary's wake. You know, she's plowing us ahead. Uh, really, really interesting concepts that she presented to us. And I'm, I'm gonna expand on these just a little bit. I come with an economic mindset because if you're not here to make money, I really don't have any interest in talking with you or going any further. I'm not a professor, I'm not a teacher per se, I've got an adjunct appointment with the University of Wisconsin, but my intention is to take some of the great concepts like Mary talked about and bring them right down to you, right down to our feed yards, to our farms, so that you can put some of these practices in place, but they've gotta be related to the bottom line. So anybody wanna guess what I've got up here? <laughs> Corn's cheap, right? Nathan and I were just talking about this. You put 50 cents basis on top of this, we're looking at seven, seven and a half corn. I've seen this before, we've seen this before. It's been up where the eight with the geopolitical unrest we're seeing, who knows where this is gonna land. But we've got expensive corn. How are beans and bean meal and protein doing? Pretty picture, huh? Pretty picture. So we, we're gonna talk a lot about inputs, whether it be from the soil, as urea, as, as uh, Darren mentioned earlier today, through to inputs in front of our cattle in the feed bunk. Things are pretty expensive. Thankfully, our commodities are tied together, so things tend to shift. Beef, milk prices are, are shifting, so our margins are there, but we have every incentive in the world to protect our corn and protein, and what I'm gonna try and convince you of today, like Mary mentioned earlier, there's a lot of corn and there's a lot of protein and soybeans nested within our soybean, or within our, our small grain silages, potentially. You're still probably wondering, what the hell does this have to do with silage fermentation analysis? We'll get there. We'll get there. All right, here's our agenda. Skip past that. Got to chew back some of those five minutes. Thanks, Matt. <clears throat> so when we look at a fermentation analysis, and I'm kidding. Matt's a great guy. A lot to teach us, so he could have carried another half hour and I would have stayed with him. But when we look at a fermentation analysis, we look at it from two different angles. One is from energy. So I've got corn up there. And if we don't do as good of job as we could have, maybe we need to supplement our rations with more grain. And what is from a health standpoint? We want healthy cattle. And what I'll show and contend that if we don't do a good job in preserving our forages, there are anti-nutritional aspects to our feed that can show up that'll, that'll rob us of gains, rob us of health and performance. It's, and it's beyond mold, uh, mold yeast and mycotoxins, it's beyond mycotoxins. So really the objective with ensiling forage is harvesting, let's say 100 ton, and we want to feed out how many ton? 105? I like your math. You're in a federal employee, are you? <laughs> Sorry to all of our federal employees in the room. <clears throat> we want to feed out as close to 100 as possible. And yeah, I, I could go down a rabbit hole real quickly with this one, but I love, you, love the answer. So we want to feed out 100. And what did Mary show us earlier? How many do we end up feeding out? What did our TDN do between green chop and between fermented? We don't get close to 100 ton. Dr. Lehman Kung is gonna talk about some strategies that we can have to get closer to 100 ton, but we're, we're probably feeding 96, 97 ton out of that 100 at best. 
And at worst, we're probably down even as low as 70 to 75 ton. Meaning we spent dollars on fertility, growing that crop, harvesting that crop, harvested 100 tons, and we just lit 25% of it on fire. Our fermentation analysis, the sweet topic that I'm getting into, is going to help us understand how we did. I've been exposed in my uh, 10, 15 years now in the industry since grad school. Uh, I've, I've seen a lot of different silos. Uh, up on the top left-hand corner, uh, that, and actually on the left-hand side, those are our silos or clamps in Brazil. Our Brazilian colleagues would recognize these. Uh, that upper one there was actually in the soil. Uh, on the right-hand side, upper right-hand corner, that'd be some baleage I saw uh, in Australia. Actually, I was uh, on some farms with a lot of my teammates down there who since uh, passed, but great guy. And then on the bottom right-hand side, one of our bigger silage pits out in the west in, in California. And this might be a little bit more similar to what we would see here in Nebraska in, in the central plains, high plains. I think there are quite a few opportunities, and Mary and I were discussing this before. So uh, fermentation analysis will tell us how efficiently we preserve that feed. How close to that 100 ton did we get? Or if you want to think about it like your uh, distance to empty on your vehicle, how, how efficient are we? How far can we get? Uh, if, if we don't do a good job preserving our feed, we're going to lose protein, we're going to lose corn. But before I even get into that, I'll, I'll, uh, and I'm going to talk about oxygen being the enemy of ensiling, covering. Covering, covering. Covering is something we have to work on and do. And what I'll show you is some economics. There's far too much value in this crop. Even if we've only got uh, $200 to $250 cost of production per acre, there may be five, $600 in value per acre in that crop. And it, it's just too valuable with where corn and beans are at, where energy and protein's at. So here are a couple uh, silage pits that a colleague of mine sent me from some yard somewhere. And I, 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 wouldn't be willing, I would be willing to bet that there's probably 15 to 20 ton that, were, that are just left out in the field in, in these pits. So I, I won't get into this in too much uh, depth. I'm going to focus on silage. Uh, I, I've added some content as, as I've listened to the presenters ahead of me this morning uh, to, to show you in the upper right hand corner, I'm going to have some graphics that look like this. These are distributions of data from Rock River Laboratory. So that's what I do by day. Uh, I mentioned my University of Wisconsin affiliation. I also do some private consulting. But at, the at, at Rock River, where I spend most of my time, I like to, to look at data so as to understand what opportunities are out there. So in the upper right-hand corner is uh, our population distribution. So there's several thousand results of small grain silages summarized. And you're familiar with bell curves, right? So then there are three horizontal lines in each of those crop years. So we got small grain silage uh, harvested in 19, 20, and 21. And then the three horizontal lines correspond to the 15th, 50th and 85th percentile. So to give you some idea of the distribution within each of those years. Well, this is just to, to uh, take the point home that Mary mentioned this morning or earlier. Here's our dry matter content. So what do you see for average dry matter content in small grain silages analyzed by Rock River Laboratory locations in the U.S.? We average about 34, 35, and you see a sizable portion that are 30 percent or less. So that, that's a big management, big focal point. To, to hit on, just let things wilt a little bit longer just to drive home further the point of understanding what our, our moistures are when we go and chop that out of the field. All right, let's do some economics. You ready to take all this in with me? You should smile and say, you goofball, absolutely not. But my point here being, and again, uh, I'm referencing Mary's talk earlier, is if we've got small grain silage, so I've got three columns, if you look at the top in green there, 12, 14, 16%, uh, that, that'd be crude protein on top. And then let's also consider some sugar content in small grain silage at five, six, or 7%. So we're going from, on the right-hand side, that'd be our boot stage, and then uh, that more mature harvest stage like we discussed earlier today. But really what I wanna, uh, I wanna show you here is that if we don't do as good of a job in preserving our forage, uh, and, and we talk about tons fed out relative to tons harvested, but those tons that we lose, it's not representative of the tons that we harvest. What are the nutrients that we lose when fermentation goes sideways? The good stuff, the candy, the high value ingredients. So what I'll show you are some economics if we've got I think, what did I have up here? Um, tonnages were in that same ballpark as what we saw earlier today. Uh, but if we, use, if we lose 10% of our protein, 10% of our sugar in those, the yellow rows, 
we're looking at roughly forty and eight dollars per acre that we left out there. That we left out there, and this is corn grain and DDGs or protein that we're going to have to bring back into diets that could have been provided by the forage. And I see this all the time. We see this all the time. Don't worry about the numbers, but just focus on the red box down at the bottom. If we have minimal shrink or what um, Becky's going to talk about later, dry matter losses, I think I got to use the right verbiage, right? Dry matter loss, not, not shrink per se, but we can easily lose five bucks a ton in value in sugars and protein. And fermentation analysis gives us some insight into that. How well did we do? And there are quite a few experts in this room. So I'm going to set the stage, but it, it's going to take probably revisiting uh, fermentation analysis to really understand how, how this can, uh, can, can be translated into what, our, what, what we could have done better. <laughs> Speaking to corn silage, uh, we, we see, where's Lehman at? Dr. Kong, what do we see in uh, shrink or, or dry matter losses? What's kind of the range with corn solids that you might speculate? Three to 7% would be an average. So I've looked at, coming back to that point I made earlier, these are high valuable nutrients that we're losing in, in the forage. 3% shrink with a ton of corn solids. Anybody want to guess how many bushels of corn that might be? Half bushel of corn per ton. Half bushel of corn per ton that we're going to have to come back and supplement. So that'd be, what's corn worth now? Seven bucks. So we're talking about three and a half dollars, probably at minimum per ton, tied into dry matter, dry matter losses. And that, that's corn we need to bring back into the ration. So shrink and losses can happen in a lot of different spots uh, from harvest to, uh, to the, the uh, pile. Uh, within the pile, and that's what I'm going to focus on and what fermentation analysis can show us. And then also between uh, when, when we have that pile and stable feed, hopefully, in, in the silo and then, then feed out. And I'm not going to hit on feed out too much, but I, I think there will be some good insight coming uh, after, after me today because we can have substantial losses uh, when, we, when we feed that silage back out. So there are a lot of different aspects to ensiling. It's, it's a complicated process and preserving hopefully close to 100 ton. Uh, oxygen is, is really our, our enemy here. So for, for us all in the room, oxygen is what we thrive upon. But in an anaerobic silo, oxygen is our enemy. We want to we go to the extent we can to keep oxygen out of the system. So I, I mentioned covering our piles before. I showed you some uncovered piles. Uh, the other thing that we can really, I think, do a better job on is packing, packing, packing. Uh, I, I had heard a rumor that uh, average densities on small grain silage here in Nebraska through survey were somewhere in the neighborhood of four to eight. Is that right? And the, what's that? Eight. Yeah, yeah. Four, four to eight pounds uh, of dry matter per cubic foot. And that's an assessment we can make. Uh, as, as extension and, and support teammates, where we, we take a, a drill, we drill into the, the pile, and we look at the weight and the volume removed because we know the diameter of that drill bit. Have to do some complicated math, but then we look at just how many how many grams or pounds we pull out of that area, and then we can calculate. All right, what's the density of that that mass? And in the dairy industry, we've really latched on to this, and so we've been able to uh, reach some higher numbers of say 20, even 22 pounds. And, and what that equates to is there's just less air in the system, more mass, and then moisture taken into account as well. Oxygen and gases can't get in, so we push that out. There's been pretty good research over the last 20 years showing us that the lower the density, the higher the feed losses, and it's a linear relationship. And we'll, we'll get 10, 15, 20% losses if we've got that really fluffy pillow-like silage. So oxygen's our enemy, and the way that we can push that out of the system is keeping, keeping silage covered, sealing around the edges, even sealing over the face when we're feeding it out, but then packing it as we, as we put it in. So those are two really big management aspects to bear in mind as we look at preserving this high value feed in small grain silage uh, or in our silages for bringing into the ration. 
So let's talk a little bit then now getting into what happens uh, from a, a biochemistry and, and a microbiology standpoint. And I, I wasn't trained, you know, so I'm, you see me wearing my red shoes. Anybody curious why I wear sneakers to give a talk or what, why, what shoes? I, I, usually I'll ask the audience, all right, what shoes do I have on? And I'll give you five bucks. Well, Lane figured it out because he's, uh, he's got similar tastes to, to myself. So these are Air Jordan 11s. These were originally released in 1995. And growing up as a, as a kid around agriculture, you know, I had tons of money, right? <laughs> I couldn't get any of these shoes when I was growing up, right? So then, then, it, then Nike uh, figures out there are idiots like me that didn't get these shoes when we were kids, and they're re-releasing them. And I can't stop from clicking buy on my app. So I've got, got a few different of these retro sneakers. So it's become my thing when giving talks. And you'd be surprised, you wouldn't be surprised probably about the, the conversations that it generates. Becky and I, when we saw each other, all right, what, what shoes you got this time? So I got my, do I call them Husker Red? Can, do I do that? Yeah, how, how my Husker Red? I'm a, I'm a Badger, so I can call them Badger Red too. But hopefully I'm playing up with you guys well enough. All right, back to the point at hand. <laughs> Fermentation, very interesting topic, right? You're with me yet? So what we do is, is the, when, when we pack silage up and, and the, the air's out of the system. So step one is getting the air out of the system. And then our fermenting bugs can, can do their thing. And what fermentation bacteria do, and, and if we don't use an inoculant, we're relying on whatever mother nature has provided us and whatever, whatever the natural, naturally occurring microorganisms are out on the standing crop. Those are called epiphytic. I'm a big proponent of, uh, of inoculants. I can tell you I'm, I'm not on the take with Lalamond or Hansen or any of those other groups, but I'm a big proponent of inoculants based upon the research. We know that if we put the right organisms on the crop, it can help us drive, hopefully, this ideal fermentation. So what I've got here is a graph, and there are gonna be a few that look like these. On the left-hand side, on that y-axis, it's pH or percentage of dry matter. And then on the x-axis, we have fermentation days from, uh, or days under plastic, or days in the silo, between zero and 30. We, we should have our ensiling, that fermentation should be straightened out uh, by about 30 days in most cases. So on day zero, we've got our green chop, and the orange would be water-soluble carbohydrate. That'd be our sugar. So fermentation bacteria, they digest readily digestible carbohydrates, sugars, in some cases starch. And what these uh, bacteria do in anaerobic conditions, in ideal conditions, will be to produce lactic acid, perhaps a little bit of acetic acid, and then the pH drops. So the lactic acid in this case is detailed by those green or brown triangles. And then the, you see the pH uh, it detailed in those blue diamonds, pH of the system decreases. Then it effectively pickles the silage and then stops all microbial growth, uh, hopefully in, in seven, 10, 15 days. And then that silage is stable for years if we keep the oxygen out of the system. I've been with Rock River for 10 years and we've, we've had a few droughts in my time. And I was exposed to, or I, somebody showed me some silage that was harvested and ensiled in 1988. 1988, and the guy remembered where that was on his upright silo, and we looked at it in the lab in 2015. You wouldn't have known it was any different than the, the year or two after it was harvested. It can stay good that long if we do the right things. When we don't do the right things, the system looks like this, and I'm gonna come back to that other graphic here in a second. So if, if we don't get the oxygen out of the system, if we don't have our moistures right, or if we don't have enough sugar perhaps to drive uh, drive the, the, the process, we can have a situation like this. So we start, we might start at 10% sugar in that green chop. And if we don't have an efficient system, the fermentation takes a while. The bacteria might have to spend some time consuming some of the oxygen, or maybe it's too fluffy. Maybe oxygen just keeps coming in and we just keep chugging and chugging and chugging. I would analogize this to getting stuck in the field with wet conditions. If we're pulling through, and we get stuck in the field, our wheels are just turning, we're burning fuel, we're not going anywhere. I see, unfortunately, too many silos that look like this. And those wetter silos, that wetter forage, it's, this is the condition there as well. It takes a lot more acid, takes a lot more uh, ensiling time to reach a stable endpoint. Sometimes we never do, which I'll talk about in another slide. But here, you see the orange drops all the way down to 2% or even zero. All of our sugar is gone. That's eight units of sugar gone. That'd be eight ton of sugar for every hundred gone. And eventually fermentation acids are, are produced, but it took us a month, to maybe two months to get to that stable point if we get there. 
I'm going to come back to another situation where we, uh, this is another ideal situation. Uh, so there are, are, are two types of fermentation. There's a homo-fermentative and a hetero-fermentative. And uh, again, I'm not going to dive into these too deeply. But in this case, if we use a lactobacillus buchneri inoculant, uh, for example, we want to drive that upfront fermentation where we produce lactic acid with sugar, but we also produce a little bit of acetic acid. Because remember, think back to where I talked about where shrink and dry matter losses happen. Some happens in the silo, but, but a lot can also happen at feed out. So I think there'll be a little bit more on that topic coming later today. But in this type of fermentation, we give up a little bit of acetic acid, or excuse me, lactic acid production for uh, a little bit of an increase in acetic acid. And then that acts as a preservative upon feed out. Much like if you read the uh, side or the, the ingredients on bread or some other, other foods, you'll see some sorbates and benzoates sometimes in there. And that acts as a, an anti mold ingredient in, in our food. Uh, acetic acid in silage acts kind of the same way. It prevents yeast and mold growing when we open that back up. And if we don't do a good of a job, as good of a job, or there's, there's, uh, we don't feed out fast enough, or we've got more air in the system, we, this can be really helpful for that feed out stability. All right, to come back to our, our less than ideal situation, and then um, really where, where we lose out on those tons harvested is right here. So this water-soluble carbohydrate, this eight units decrease, that's, that's really shows up as heat. So one way that we can, can look at and understand how well we did in, in fermentation, in, in addition to the analysis, is to look at silage temperatures. So the, here we've got date on the x-axis and we've got temperature on the y. So as we go through in siling, there's a little bit of a heat of, heat of fermentation that, that happens. And, and a, a good fermentation may increase roughly 10 degrees. It cooks and, and then cools back down. So here, if this was silage harvested in, in mid-August, under the optimal conditions, they're detailed in blue, we'd increase roughly 10 degrees and then we'd cool back down. If we have an inefficient or, heaven forbid, an uncontrolled fermentation where we just didn't get where we need to be, we produce a lot more heat. In fact, it may never even cool down, never cure. And we, we get into these situations where we leave 10 to 15 tons more out in the field. And that's these sugars being broken down and heat produced with those sugars. So temperature is another tool we can use. All right, so then the last, uh, last case of, of the process of fermentation, I'm not trying to make you all microbiologists or, or silage uh, experts in, in the process here, but just to expose you to some of the different complex pathways that can happen. We get into this butyric acid condition that was mentioned earlier today. So in this case, you see the graphic that looks similar to the less than ideal case I showed you before. Well, if we don't ever get our silage stable, clostridial organisms are pretty hardy. They can exist in feed, even to the point where you drop the silage pH and there's no oxygen. And if we don't get the pH quite low enough or these clostridial organisms can, can grow and come to life. We can have something, a phenomenon called secondary fermentation happen. And we, we see this a lot in small grain silages because we either didn't have enough sugar, we didn't preserve them as well. For whatever reason, we didn't get them stable. So after about a month to three months, all of a sudden these butyric acid producing bugs, clostridial organisms will come on and start growing. And in this case, you see my little kindergarten extension of this graph here, but clostridial organisms can not only utilize sugar, but they can use protein and they can actually degrade fermentation acids, I think. I think my, my understanding is correct. So the lactic acid in green, that can actually decrease over time. Acetic acid can decrease over time. And then when we, those acids are broken down by these organisms, the pH of the silage increases. And then that leads to a negative cascade of other microbes growing because we've lost our stability. And we see our butyric acid coming on. So in some cases where Mother Nature, uh, we've got a, a monsoon coming at us and we have some, have some rye down or some trit down, we may have to go get it out of the field at, at lower than ideal moisture content. In cases like that, if we're uh, going to find ourselves in a situation like this, even with an inoculant, I, I, may, I may make the recommendation of, all right, let's, let's get in and start feeding that sooner than later. Because if we get into this situation, what I've shown you there on the right-hand side, it never stops. It just keeps deteriorating. The longer we let it sit there, the worse and worse and worse it gets to the point of we might lose 50% of what we had in there and or we, we may have to spread it back out on the field because we do get to points where there's so much butyric acid and that's the super, super stinky stuff you can't get off your hands for days uh, where, where cattle won't even eat it. 
So there are a number of different ways that we can we can look at shrink fermentation loss. It's pretty intriguing what uh, Mary showed us before looking at green and uh, green shop and fresh forages. There is uh, I published a paper uh, with some colleagues in meta analysis in 2015 where I, I surveyed literature that had uh, measured dry matter losses in mini silo studies, inoculant studies, and I, I, I came up with a predictive equation. So if you do some fermentation analyses. Uh, through Rock River or elsewhere, you can apply this equation. We apply this on our, our forage analysis reports, and there are some forage analysis reports that I think you'll get access to hands-on uh, in lunch or later, so you could look look for this on the report. Uh, but but we, we predict and calculate a fermentation dry matter loss number, which is really tightly correlated to moisture, pH, lactic acid, acetic acid, the factors I'm telling you that are, are driving uh, these losses. And so I've graphed these out. My colleague at Rock River actually did these for me this morning. We can see on the left-hand side, you can see shrink. You can see when it happens. You see the silage sinking in, in the pits, in the bunkers. It, it's tough to estimate at times how much we lose. And, and again, it's the high-quality nutrients, high-value nutrients that we're losing. But on, the, on, the, uh, on these two graphics here on the right-hand side, this is small-grain silage run through this meta-analysis calculation, predicting just the, the shrink or dry matter losses tied into fermentation. So this isn't harvest, this isn't, these aren't feed out losses, these are just fermentation dry matter losses. And I broke it out into two different moisture classes so you can see the impact of just moisture uh, in itself. So on, you see three different crop years, you see that distribution uh, it, with it, where it averages about four units of dry matter loss for 65 to 75 moisture or 35 to 45 dry matter. That's, that's where we wanna be. But when we find ourselves in those wetter conditions, such as, um, oh, excuse me, 65 to 75 moisture, that's not where we wanna be. Somebody's gotta call me on this when I screw up. I, I speak dry matter most of the time, so I'm, I'm crossing myself up. But all right, on the bottom is where we wanna be at, 55 to 65. So that's our 35 dry matter to 45 dry matter. That's where we wanna be. So you see that we're about two and a half units of dry matter loss, and you see the range is anywhere from as low as one and a half up to maybe three to four, but pretty tight window. So that, that would be, we, we set that crop up to succeed in the silo, provide we pack it and cover it well. When we look at the top with that wetter feed, it is this type of situation where it just takes longer and longer and longer for that stuff to ferment. And so we average one or two units greater dry matter loss. And then look at the tails out to the right. We see some six, nines plus, and that's strictly dry matter losses, strictly dry matter losses during the ensiling. So when we, when we cross that 35 dry matter, six, uh, 65 moisture threshold and get in the lower 30s or upper, upper 20s for, for dry matters, it's really tough to effectively preserve that crop and, and keep it stable toward, toward feed out, toward feed out. So moisture is, is a big one, is a big one to nail down. All right, so uh, back, <laughs> I'll get to fermentation analysis eventually, but back to our point, what are we trying to do? What have I told you 10 times over now? What are we trying to do? 100 tons, we're gonna to feed out 105. Yeah, we're gonna feed out 105. So here I've got uh, in the proceedings in some QR codes, these are pretty complex and I'm gonna distill it down to a couple of points. At the laboratory now, we measure a lot of different compounds for different purposes. We can look at that preservation efficiency. We can look at some other things, but I'll, I'll hopefully just leave you with a few points as I take us to the finish line and get you all to the feed bunk in not too long. When we look at corn silage, small grain silage, uh, we, we tend to look at pH, lactic, acetic acid, the ratio of lactic to acetic and butyric acid. Uh, with corn silage, I, I tend to start looking at the moisture of the crop, the pH, and then the lactic and acetic acid amounts, uh, and then we get into the weeds on some other stuff. So if you, if you go to this website indicated by the QR code, it'll take you to the guidelines uh, available from Rock River Laboratory, but I've just taken screenshots here. So uh, I'm gonna skip past corn silage and, and let's look at sorghum and, and grass silages in, in a little bit more detail. So as you look at these, uh, these tables, I guess, we're gonna have our parameters and then we're gonna have our mean and median. So these are not evenly distributed data. Don't worry about the statistics, but I, I'll point out, and we can focus on the 15th and 85th percentile, those two columns on the right-hand side. So uh, depending upon the parameter, either the 15th or the 85th we, percentile we could look at as a goal. 
And these are looking at all of Rockefeller Labs data over the last four years and looking at the distribution and looking at, all right, which is the ideal number and where does that number lie? So in the case of sorghum silage, the lower the pH, the better. We got high pH. Again, that's, that just means that more bugs can grow. So we see the lower 15th percentile at about 3.8. So we really want to be below 4% or four units of, of pH. Uh, when we look at lactic acid, in most cases, a higher lactic acid level is better, but there are cases where we have really wet forages where we may have a whole bunch of acid production where that's not necessarily ideal. But the higher end, what we see is six, seven, eight percent lactic acid. In the case of uh, acetic acid, unless we use a lactobacillus buchneri inoculant, we generally don't want to see much acetic acid production. And that holds true for sorghum and small grain silages. The more acetic acid produced, that gives me an indication that we weren't as efficient as we can be. So here's, here's our little bit of biochemistry lesson for today. If we produce lactic acid from plant sugar, plant sugar has six carbons in general. You ready for your math lesson too? Math and biochemistry, here we go. Let's do this. So let's say we start with six carbons, a little molecule of a sugar. Lactic acid is three carbons. So if we go from a six to a three and a three, what is our carbon preservation? Somebody, I hear a lot of, there we go, 100%. Six equals three plus three. Lactic is three, as I mentioned before, acetic acid is two carbons. So if we go from a six to a three and a two, we lost a carbon, right? And that carbon goes where? To CO2 gas, bye-bye. It's not digestible, it's not usable, it's gone. That's our dry loss, or part of our dry loss. Or if we go from a six to two twos, it's two carbons. So that's why we look at acetic acid as an indication of inefficiency. That's indicating to us that when we look at the stoichiometry, and I had to go remember some of my biochemistry as I started to re relearn some of this stuff, that gives us an indication of what we have for dry matter loss. So the, again, the only caveat though is when we use a Buchneri inoculant where we strategically want to produce some acetic acid. So in that case, it's okay. But in all other cases, if we're using a, any other sort of inoculant or we're not using any inoculants whatsoever, uh, we don't want to see much acetic acid. So we see as low as zero to one would, would, would be a good target. But if we're getting above 1% acetic acid and we're not using a Buchner, that's an indication that we could have done better. So here's what we see uh, in grass haylages, which would include our small grain silages. Uh, so in the, these cases, uh, you know, with some of the, the mineral uptake that we talked about uh, earlier from an agronomy perspective, that there's a little bit greater buffering capacity. Uh, acting kind of like Tums, if you will, in the silage. So it's a little bit diff more difficult to decrease the pH in, in some of our grass silages where we have quite a bit of mineral content. So our pHs uh, are a little bit higher typically in these, but we, we, we want to get below 4.2 to 4.5 typically uh, if we've got higher mineral content in these. And you see a higher uh, lactic level is, is a, a ideal at, at 5 6%. And again, very little acetic is, is where we want to be. Where we want to be. We can talk about some other aspects of fermentation analyses, and I think one that I might mention that I didn't highlight in red would be ammonia nitrogen as a percentage of crude protein. Uh, just in the last few minutes as, as I work us toward the finish line. So lactic, acetic, uh, the ratios, they tell us about efficiency, and that's more from an energy standpoint. That's looking at that corn equivalent, that sugar loss. Well, we can also lose protein, and I mentioned butyric acid is an indication that we likely have substantial amino acid and protein breakdown. We also look at ammonia nitrogen in fermentation analyses, and I like to look at that as a percentage of crude protein. So when we have a standing crop at 12 to 16% crude protein in that crop, that's, that's plant amino acid, that's good protein standing in the field. At the lab, when we measure crude protein, what we actually do is measure total nitrogen in the sample. We don't necessarily differentiate between crude protein, amino acid, and nitrogen that's, that, that is uh, ammonia that results from broken down amino acids. So I, I uh, analogize in one of the Hay and Forge articles uh, I wrote uh, to, to ammonia, nitrogen being kind of like a Lego, a building block, which can be built into amino acids, which might be like a castle that my kid builds. And amino acids and crude protein are what's valuable in the ration. That, that's where we can, we can cut back on our protein supplementation. But if we see higher levels of ammonia nitrogen on our fermentation analysis, 
that's an indication to me that we might have a 12 to 16% listed crude protein, but what the cattle might actually recognize might not be anywhere close to that. Because if we have 10 to 20% of our crude protein is actually ammonia, that's an indication that we broke those amino acids down, we broke that protein down, just like if I took my kid's Lego castle and I kicked it. It'd be pretty torqued off with me, and cattle are gonna tell us the same thing. If we put silage that's got a whole bunch of ammonia nitrogen, a whole bunch of broken down protein and amino acids. John, in it. We, I got a question online that's related to that. Yes, sir. If you want to take it. It says, and siling is an alternative for high nitrate small grains, uh, but the ammonia generated can be deleterious to fermentation parameters and intake. Any comment uh, or thoughts about that? So if we have high nitrates from the conditions like Matt talked about before, those nitrates can be, can be built by fermenting organisms into uh, microbial protein, which would decrease or de uh, change the, uh, the nitrate in, in the silage. And I think that, that question is a little, gets into the weeds a little bit. So with, I, I'll, I'll list my contact information. We can come back to that. So we, we, we will break nitrate or bring nitrate into a, a less detrimental form, but I, I don't want to confuse the ammonia nitrogen concept I'm seeking to drive home right now with what nitrate does in, in, in siling and the microbiology in siling. So generally ammonia nitrogen would, would not be a good thing, but if we convert nitrate into ammonia nitrogen, well then that could be conceivably a good thing because it's not nitrate anymore and it's not at least toxic. Are you okay with that one? I said it confidently, so. <laughs> All right, we're gonna skip past this. Um, and uh, let, let's just get to one, one last aspect as I send you all to the feed bunk. Ready? <laughs> Yum. Yum. I like to tell, tell stories with pictures. So what do, you, what do you see here? What kind of lunch do we have today? <laughs> beef? Yeah, yeah. So if we left the, the beef that we're about to get into out for about two weeks, would we want to eat it? What would, we, what would it look like? What would it look like, tar? We can see it pretty easily with our eyes, right? Well, and, and you see, whose shop fridge is this? I took some pictures in shop fridges, but, so we can see, if, if we go in and we dive into these fridge for lunch, it's not gonna treat us real well, right? We're gonna, we're gonna know, need to get some Bilardi or some probiotics to get our guts straightened back out. But in this case, we, we can visually see what's happening. What I'll tell you is there, there are anti-nutritional aspects in silages that we can't see with our eyes. And this has been a fascinating area because as I look at cattle performance and dairy performance, there are numerous different aspects that, that uh, we can explore with, with this cleanliness aspect of feed. So this gets to that health aspect. So up to this point, I've talked about energetic and protein losses and where fermentation analyses can give us some insight. There's a whole other area of fermentation assessments and evaluation, which gets at the healthy or the hygienic characteristics of our silage. We've got fungal contaminants, we have bacterial contaminants, we might have other anti-nutritional compounds present in feed, which can act just like this does with our digestive tract. So I'm not gonna get into it in too much depth because I wanna put you all out in front of the feed bunk, hopefully not with this uh, in, in mind as, as we sit down and, and have lunch, but this is an area we need to dive into more deeply in beef nutrition. I've gotten into it fairly deeply on the dairy side, uh, but recognize I have so much yet to learn. Dairy cows consume about twice to a little bit more than that amount of feed, so the, the exposure for these anti-nutritional compounds in dairy cattle is a little bit greater and their life cycle is a little bit longer, so they're a bit more sensitive. But I'm pretty well convinced we have efficiency opportunities in, in beef diets, uh, finishing and, and backgrounding tied back to some of these aspects. And it, it ties into how well did we preserve our feed? And it's things that we can't see. So just get uh, to the keys to quality silage here. Uh, I, I, I can't stress enough the, the moisture aspect. So harvesting at the right moisture, uh, sugar and having a high sugar crop is gonna be very helpful for us so that we have that fuel for those fermentation organisms. If we do get rained on crops and where we have a, a half inch to more rain on some, some uh, trit or, or, or small grain that we've got wilting in the field, there's not gonna be as much sugar there. So we need to be extra, extra cautious about harvesting at the right moisture and doing everything we can to get oxygen out of the system. 
I like having one of the decision makers on farm actually on the pack tractor or at the silo so they can see the crop coming in. I think back to my uncles as a kid and they were farming. I mean, they, they'd want to be driving the fancy equipment, the choppers, but really when it comes to high quality, making high quality silage, the most influential stakeholder should be on that pack tractor watching that crop come in. Because if we're seeing it come in too wet, we're seeing it juice or so we, we got to stop. We got to stop. We got to let it dry out a little bit. So I like having our decision makers on the pack tractor. And then uh, I, I'll just put a plug in for, for Becky and Lehman, listen to what they have to tell you later. They're far smarter than I. So hopefully I've at least set a foundation for them to, to build upon and, and teach you everything that I, I screwed up. So here's my contact information if you wanna get out to me. Uh, I'm, I'm silly enough to put my mobile phone up uh, in front of people. I, if you wanna give me a call, drop me a text, by all means, please do. Uh, at, at John Gazer on social media. I, I try and put a couple things out here and there. I'm not necessarily a social media influencer by any means, but that's me and I like to shoot stuff. Anybody else like, like going on that path with me? So any questions as we uh, head toward lunch? Complex topic, hopefully you can grasp a couple of points, but, but continue on hopefully with some interest in learning. We've got a lot to learn from our fermentation analyses and especially with where our, our corn and bean and protein prices are at. Uh, there's so much incentive for us to do everything we can this year to maintain every bushel of corn, every bushel of beans, every ton of soybean meal in our silage that we can. So thanks for the opportunity. I appreciate the invite to come in and talk beef.